is Eastern Spring, uh, Dr. Hat and Cole Fancy Sandy. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I think I can say without exaggeration that uh, um, meeting Dick and being at uh, CETA had even more profound effect on me than most, because if it were for my stay at CETA, I would just be the team cut large structure guy. But this guy scooped me on CMB, and uh, it's a habit I couldn't pick ever since. So thank you, Dick. So, naturally, I will talk about C and D, and maybe we have to think of the work on high and volume and uh, hot and cold spots. And uh, Rob Paul provided a great introduction, just introduction for this, so I can skip most of it, just to remind you that the, IFW, the name IFW fact is, um, depends on the derivative of the potential, and it's considered to be a smoking gun of dark energy, so that's not the reason it is um, interesting. When you are listing a factor of two, uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so basically, the most standard method, as we have seen, is to correlate two catalogs, and I'm, I, I will be using for the start the SDSS LRG and the W map, uh, which, which has shown here. Um, but instead of just correlating them together, we have developed at least three methods, and I, I will briefly talk about each of them, even though we did do cross-correlation as well. What's not so uh, satisfying about cross-correlation is a couple of things. One is that it's suboptimal. The other thing is that um, it's not very physical. If, if the two sets are correlated, it doesn't necessarily mean it's IFW. It can be for all sorts of reasons. So we were searching for a method um, which is um, more physics-based, and it would be more optimal. Furthermore, in the case of IFW, cross-correlation just considers the galaxy catalog as a statistical ensemble. But we actually know, for instance, if there is a cluster, somewhere. It's going to produce a hotspot. It's not just a general correlation. So all these ideas can be incorporated by simply reconstructing the potential, the ISW potential, by ray tracing the galaxy catalog under some simple assumptions. And then you get something like this, an ISW map, which directly corresponds to this galaxy catalog. And then if you ever been to CETA, then you will try to use maximum likelihood to test whether this image is contained in the CMB or not. And there's a very simple, almost obvious, mesh filter technique which you can use. If my data model is that there is a CMB plus some extra um, image multiplied by an unknown number, for instance, due to the bias to the galaxies and so on, then, then you can find the maximum likelihood solution. And, um, and you get this. Essentially, you find roughly a two sigma, um, two sigma significance that this image is indeed contained in the CMB. And if you use foreground reduced images, the significance goes higher, which is um, a good thing. So now, as in terms of significance, this is not a huge improvement over correlation function from theoretical reasons. What you expect is about 5-10% better significance, uh, but not more, but it's more physics-based. This is actually testing whether linear ISW effect, the way we rate through the simulation, rate through the data, is contained in the CMB or not. And um, you can also compare this to the usual correlation function. Just to note, on the left side, you see the cross CLS, and we did that after optimal filtering. So there's another way trying to optimize the methods to use quadratic estimators. And then the other curve is, um, is basically the, the correlation of this image with the CMB. And the final note is that if we subtract this image from the CMB, the correlation goes essentially to zero. Okay. But we weren't just satisfied with this method. We also wanted to directly test the physical picture that do we see towards voids a cold spot and towards clusters a hot spot. And by clusters, I mean very large 
pieces of fluctuation. So what we did, we actually looked through the catalog and found the biggest, most rarest fluctuations, which are supposed to be the most the highest signal to noise in any distribution, so you know, the least probable things contain the most information. So we looked at the least probable uh, fluctuations in the galaxy catalog. And then we are showing these fluctuations mapped on the CMB. So, so uh, the galaxy catalog, each um, what we call super void and super cluster, um, contains a direction. And then we just stack these directions like, like good old astronomers. Uh, we just do the most ancient technique in astronomy, stacking them together. And lo and behold, we see a cold spot in front of the voids. We see a hot spot um, in front of the clusters. And if you subtract the two, you see a pretty high significance um, spot, in fact. And then we tested the significance of this um, um, leftmost curve. Is this, is this uh, in void a galaxy map or in high stuff? These are voids in galaxies. We are not, yeah. yeah. That would be circular <laughs> logic. We <laughs> find voids in the CMB in the stack. Right, but now I mean, I'm, yeah. you have a nice LW yeah. template, right? No, no, the LW template is a different thing. Okay. So this is just directly doing the simplest thing. And then, lo and behold, it turns out that the significance of is this image as measured by a simple um, compensated filter, which is the difference of the temperature in the middle of this circle minus the outside of the circle, which has the same area, is 4.5 sigma. So it's a very significant measurement. And Rob has mentioned that there might be some posterior problems with this measurement. To be sure, posterior problem is when you, when you try a thousand things on your data, then something, some rare event, a one in a thousand event might come up. But in this case, that's, that's not what happened, because we haven't tried a thousand things. We just tried this one thing. The only posterior problem is that we visually looked at this image. So you might say, is, is the significance robust against this filter size you're looking at? In any case, if there was a posterior problem, then you know, as soon as you perturb away for the particular parameters you use for your detection, your detection significance would go down a lot, and it's not happening. And we are not in this two, three sigma regime anyway. So this is actually a very significant detection. The other criticism was that from um, London CDM, you don't expect this kind of high signal. We are measuring 10 micro K. So to test, the, to, to think about that a little bit, we actually measure counts in cells in the Sloan survey, actually in the, in the 3D survey, and on the left to see the result, and we were trying to get how well is the Gaussian assumption showing, is describing the tail of the distribution. So this distribution is actually pretty Gaussian, but we fitted it in three different ways, just with Gaussian, a log normal distribution, or an edgeverse expansion. And for the edgeverse expansion, we also had to measure uh, S3 and S4. And as you can see, the correlation function up to you know, 150 megaparsec scales and S3 and S4 are pretty good um, agreement with lambda CDM and with even just with linear bias. We even took into account traction distortions and whatnot, but I don't want to talk about that. And if you look at the uh, first focus on the dashed line, what usually people use for the estimate of the IFW effect is the simple uh, rhythmic formula which assumes a compensating void. And there are other generalizations from GR, like um, Cedar Canino and so on, but they give within 20% similar results. And from that, indeed, you only get a few micro -k. However, if you think about it at 100 megaparsec scale, you won't have compensated void because, because 100 megaparsec void or cluster is not created by pushing material to that far away place. It's actually a Gaussian field. So what we looked at, what if I have a particular data in a Gaussian field, and then I can do constant realization of the universe given that field, 
And basically what you get is kind of a correlation function profile, what would you get from that. You can get from Gaussian distribution what would be the universe like outside of that. And then you ray trace through that. Of course, then you don't just get a line, you get the line with arrows, essentially. It's almost like being a filter, you know, what is the average signal and what is the variance of that signal which comes through that. If you do that, that if you do that, actually there is a more than a factor of two enhancement, and indeed, in this particular case, you get up to 10 microphase signals. So it turns out that this measurement is consistent with ISW, and there has been, we have done many, many tests, you know, for instance, the signal is very um, robust against the colors and W and so on. So right now, the most plausible explanation for this is um, that it could be due to ISW, in, in super voids and super clusters. Thank you. And of course, the whole thing is was motivated in some sense by the cause but the, the famous cause but that has been, you know, we already talked about that today. The cause part is this longer scenario which was claimed to be detected at the 0.5% level. Zang and Hutter take some more skeptical view um, using different kinds of statistics. And um, what we, what we were again thinking about how, how could we take a look, would we find the cold spot on the CMB just based on Gaussian statistics instead of um, basically Zunger Guter um, criticizes the original finding that it has been done with compensated um, you know, Mexican filters. Would we find it in Gaussian statistics of what significance and also differ from the observations to actually see if there is a void in the galaxy distribution. So to cut a long story short, what we did, if you, you can do the following, you can cut out a void from the CMB, a, a hole in the CMB, and then you can do constraint realizations of the CMB, right? And then you get what you have on the right um, hand side. That's the average, of course, again, you will have fluctuations, and then you can uh, test what's the significance of finding the actual temperature in that um, area. This is a little bit better than just looking at the simple Gaussian distribution in that area, because we know a lot about the CMB. If it was uncorrelated, you would get the exact same thing as just testing with the, with the variance. This is a bit like linear filtering, actually, again, but just directly applying to this. And you can even find uh, uh, spots on the CMB with this method because you could do this anywhere. In fact, we do find the cold spot as the, as the one significant thing, and we do find also a hot spot. Okay? And um, by the way, we, to do this, you have to uh, invert big matrices. What we did actually, we made this matrix very small by hierarchical pixelization because the, the probability close is only, you know, the small scale structure and the CM base is only influencing from close. So from very far away, we can take big uh, pixels. So we actually perform the whole maximum likelihood, which you need to do in this, or, or this constant realization in this pixelization around the code spot, or we can do this around any spot. And basically what we find, these are the kind of P values we find. And one interesting thing, which will be very, um, useful when plum data will be available that we can use also the polarization data in our um, constant realization because we know a lot about, we, we know some, we have an extra information about the primordial uh, temperature given the polarization. So as you see, the polarization actually increases the significance of the cold spot. It's kind of like, um, it goes up to four sigma depending on the radius you choose. But again, you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt because of the posterity problems, um, because we already know that there is a cold spot there. If we, if we do our own consistent thing and we try to find the cold spot as well as take the significance, we estimate it's about 5% or 2 sigma, so it's right at the border of the interestingness. Similarly, you can test whether the cold spot, whether the spot found by Rudney, which is not at the exact same point on the sky, you found it in the NVSS, whether that area is cold, and again, 
we find this interesting two, three sigma range. And finally, the same method can be applied to our own supervoids and superclusters, and we still get roughly the same significance as we did with the compensated filter. So finally, a few words about the observations. So this is the cold spot area, and those are our MagaCam fields, which we put on the cold spot area. And basically what we did, we did observation designed actually to find a rhythmic type huge 200 megaparsec delta minus 0.3 void. And um, the observation was designed that we go up to redshift of one, which is, um, which is where the void, the void is supposed to be between zero and one. And we would find such a void um, using a essentially used photometric redshift um, to, to create a 3D map. And I could go in a lot of details how we did this, but, but the final result is this. We could essentially do um, four redshift bins, basically, in redshift slices of 0.2, and we have all these fields. And um, basically, after this map, we could do um, a, a Bayesian MCMC inversion of the average density because we know our photometric redshift errors. So what we can do is we can invert uh, what would be the most likely density in those beams because we want a very precise um, likelihood. And the summary of this is on this figure, in these four redshift beams, essentially, you see uh, both the top two is definitely Okay, the, the arrows show the kind of void Rudnik would require this 200 megaparsec void. And you have to take the caveat that now we discover that maybe a smaller void can do a larger sigma given this uh, reconstruction. But this observation was designed for detecting that void. And that's definitely not at high redshift. At the, at the end of between 0.3 and 0.5, it's marginally consistent with such a void. And Unfortunately, at low redshift is where we have the lowest signal to noise. You can see that we have the widest um, um, curve. But basically, a void could hide at that um, place. And um, to sum it up, basically, um, PANSTARS would be able to detect that void if it really exists, because PANSTARS is perfectly matched and we have a very dense and very good sampling with good photometric capture in that area. So to sum it up, I, I, I did uh, present essentially three different methods. One is uh, a, a little generalization of the usual cross-correlation and ray-tracing the potential maps, and we essentially recovered the, the cross-correlation and the fact that linearized W is present in the CMB with the two sigma level and besides, the stacking also produced a four sigma, more than four sigma result, and it is consistent with linearized W in the concordance model if we generalize the rhythmic type formula for uncompensated, uncompensated voids. Um, we also did observations towards the cold spot area. Unfortunately, we cannot be conclusive. We can definitely say that there is no huge super void above redshift of 0.5 and <coughs> a hint of a void below redshift of 0.3, which prime stars will find. And of course, again, this observation was designed to find this huge void. A slightly smaller void could do the same kind of effect if you don't assume that it's compensated. So, so prime stars will be a huge advance in all of this because the linear SW is projected to be measured at six sigma level. Um, we can redo the superstructures also at a much larger area. And the cold spot exactly at the, at the low redshift range where our data is not conclusive, we can either say for sure if, if there is a void or not. So I would say the void either is still on the table for the cold spot explanation even though some papers claim that that's sort of you will know. So that's my conclusion. Okay. When you were doing your stacking, did you think about 
when you were doing your stacking, did you clip out the pixels that, that are known to have radio sources in them? Well, we, we just do essentially straight for thing, really just adding. Not That's no. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, you didn't try to not include the bits of the CMD sky that are known to have FBLA radio sources in them? Oh, we use the maps and everything, yes. <laughs> and, and then we did, again, we did lots of tests which, which I haven't talked about it, like correlating all these objects with known radio sources, correlating um, with different maps, and, and trying to test it in the same way in VSS and foreground uh, maps, and they all come out to the zero. Within one signal, there's no signal of these objects in the VSS you know, and program that people find. Okay, for the discussion. Can you tell us about non and show me Thanks, Ed. Thanks uh, for coming. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Hmm? <laughs> All right, so uh, I'd like to talk about non and the train and I'm going to pursue the mandatory bond joke at the very beginning here. That, uh, <laughs> I brought along the movie for us to love if you run out of time here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that so. so when nothing's like this, it's always intimidating uh, because I might not cite you, so that's where you are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really, I should say less because I know that what I'm talking about is something which was dear to his heart. So he was uh, he was interested in in trying to find trying to. Eat, in string inflation uh, models, to a to man, pretty much everybody generates primordial fluctuations in the vanilla infocon way. And I know that Lev was interested very much in, in other mechanisms that would uh, play a role in that, and was in, he proposed one of the mechanisms, the modulation mechanism. 